You're listening to the MoneyWeb Now podcast series with Simon Brown. Live streamed every weekday at 6.30 a.m. It's Friday, 8 November. Japanese household spending out earlier this morning, down 1.1% year on year. I'm Simon Brown, coming at you live and loud from the MoneyWeb Global Headquarters in Johannesburg, South Africa. On the show today, we're chatting with Carmen Meperani, independent analyst. So we have had our BOE, FOMC, uh, acronym rate cuts, uh, Grinrod and Mozambique, and the Week Truers update. We've got SAPI CEO uh, Steve Binney on uh, a strong end to the 2024 financial year. That last quarter was good. Is it continuing into the 25 financial year? And some thoughts for me on finding snippets of useful data in the haystack that is the deluge of data we get. This podcast is brought to you by Stanlip Asset Management. Invest in more global opportunities through their partnership with JP Morgan Asset Management. Morning headlines, MoneyWeb, Inside Pick and Pay's plan to double the size of Boxer in five years. Uh, watch out ShopRite Group, perhaps. Business Day, investors flee troubled Murray and Roberts. Fate of erstwhile giant of construction industry, now largely in the hand, hands of its lenders. Never a comfortable place to be. Morning markets, US was green, S&P up 0.75%, NASDAQ up 1.5%, both closing all-time highs. Uh, over in the east, it's red. Uh, Sydney down a tenth of a percent, Tokyo off a third of a percent, Hong Kong down three quarters of a percent, and Tencent down 0.8 percent. Commodities are mixed. Gold is green, $2,703 an ounce. Brent weaker, $75.21. Platinum a dollar or so higher at exactly $1,000 an ounce. Palladium weaker at $1,022. Uh, Rand 1737. Bitcoin 75,700. Top 40 opening call. Red, 400 points, half a percent lower. MoneyWeb now on the money. Also available on podcast. Turning now with uh, Carmen Mepurani, independent analyst. Carmen, appreciate the early morning time. Uh, last night we had Jerome Powell in the Federal Reserve in the afternoon. We'd had the Bank of England, both cutting rates a quarter percent. In, in both cases, it kind of felt... It kind of felt like we had moved on. And maybe it's the election. Maybe we are just waiting for Christmas to start. Or maybe it's just that we're now in the rate cutting cycle and kind of quarter percent cuts is what we're expecting for the next couple of meetings. Yeah, definitely, Simon. I think your last point is what it is. Um, you remember the last, the previous uh, Fed cut was 50 bips. Mm-hmm. So this was a lot more cautious with the 25 bips. But keeping to what you were saying is that we are in that rate cutting cycle. Um, they need to indicate to the market as well in terms of you know what their view is. Um, they they anchoring it on employment improvement in employment. Uh, this is in the U.S. and then obviously Bank of England um, post the the last week's budget. There were there is an expectation that inflation will go up, um, but mm. the 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 uh, I suppose the indication is that look it's improved. Um, let's not panic, um, but in the same breath, to be more cautious. Yeah, no, I, I take your point. It, it's improving, but I, I suppose caution remains that watchword, uh, and I take your point. We, we, we are now in that cutting cycle. It feels nice. We quickly touch on Grinrod. They, uh, we've seen the, 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 the post-election violence in Mozambique. They have shut down the internet in the country, which is astounding. But m- my sense is they put a small update. Uh, certainly it is impacting operations. Does something like this, which is, is, is horrible for Mozambicans, uh, probably leads to some tragic loss of life. But maybe for Grinrod, someone who wanted opportunity and says, well, the stock was 16 Rand. This is now 1350. Is there opportunity or am I being uh, overly callous, perhaps? <laughs> it's, a, it's such a difficult one because, you know, you never know with politics, specifically mm. unrest. You never know what the cost is going to be um, in terms of the all the damage, number one, and the shutdown. So we know that they've moved up to Mozambique because we couldn't get that chrome um, out of, of our ports. Uh, so it is a bit of a stumbling block, but I think as the the a statement it said is for caution in terms of safety for, for employees as well, 
Um, and we've also seen an escalation uh, yesterday in terms of the unrest in Maputo specifically. Yeah. So I think that taking the cautious again, sorry to use the same word, but that is sort of the vein of, of what Renrod is doing at this point. Let's go to Truvers. We had Pepcor earlier in the week. They said they were gaining market share. Truvers essentially, well, they didn't tell us, but if you if you run the numbers, uh, growth in South Africa of 0.2%. If we assume some store growth and some internal inflation, negative volumes from their trading up. Date. Is this more truers or is this going to be clothing sector wide? Certainly, I mean, even the truers share price, even after pulling back, the stock's more than doubled in the, the last year and some change. Yeah, so it's a difficult one. You know, we always think going into year end, um, you're going to see sort of an uptick. uptick. Um, funnily enough, I'm not seeing much Black Friday rhetoric this no. year. Maybe I'm, I've been offline too much. <laughs> Um, so there's that, but then I think also, as you've said, you know, that they've had, they've had a really great run, um, coming up, but I I think in terms of true, I always think about the price point Mm. and the fact that they anchor on, um, 70% of their sales come from the accounts. And as you've mentioned earlier, we're going into this rate decrease cycle. So it doesn't have an impact on this. It doesn't uh, impact what these numbers that have just come out. And as you talk about volumes, but dropping to the bottom line is probably going to see an impact going forward. I, I, I get your point on that. And I mean, I, I take the Black Friday. It, it is, what are we today? The 8th. And I've seen nothing. Usually by now, yeah. we have been overwhelmed with Black Friday news uh, and sales. We leave it there. Common Mepo, one independent analyst. Always appreciate the early morning time. And that's our poll today on LinkedIn and Twitter. Should we be concerned about loathing, local clothing retailers? Is it just true? Because that was a poor update, particularly compared to Pep. Or is there something uh, more happening here? Have your vote, have your say, LinkedIn and Twitter. Give you money, smoother returns for Stanlib Asset Management. The Stanlib Flexible Income Fund's agile investment process preserves and grows capital in all markets. MoneyWeb now on the money. I'm chatting with SAPI CEO Steve Binney. Results for the quarter and year ending September for the full year. Revenue down 6% adjusted. Earnings per share in US cents, 41 versus 52. And a US 14 cent dividend versus 15. Steve, a very strong last quarter. A tough year, but a very strong fourth quarter for the business. Yeah, we were thrilled actually with the last quarter. Um, What we've seen throughout the current financial year was a progressive recovery. We made a good start to the prior year. And then, as you know, the global macroeconomic challenges came along and that obviously impacted our business. And we've progressively been improving since then. So very satisfied with the final quarter results. And certainly as we look forward into the new financial year, we're pretty upbeat about our prospects. That was going to be my question. It it, it certainly was a sort of evolution through the year. You've had some trading since the year end, and you're saying there that you do think that positive trend can continue. Yeah, indeed. Look, if you unpack the results, certain of our segments have done very, very well, but others have been slower to recover. And what we've seen, it's kind of been a progressive recovery. Certainly looks like it's continuing into the next quarter. How much is market conditions versus sort of sappy operational, which you control? You talk around capacity utilization, aligning with demand, inventory optimization. How much is it that versus a a sort of a stronger market in the ground in the markets that you operate? It's actually coming from both sides. I mean, firstly, on dissolving pulp, excellent year, good mm-hmm. market conditions with strong demand, prices were better. And that came off, you know, as I said earlier, the, the kind of 2023, which was particularly tough for consumers, which had an impact on the demand for clothing and textiles. So as economic conditions have progressively got better, you know, we benefited from that. But at the same time, we had to take action. And as you indicated, we closed capacity. We closed two mills in Europe. Mm-hmm. And that enabled us to take substantial fixed costs out of the business. And then obviously, we shifted the production that was at those mills to, to other mills, which boosted the operating rates at those mills and made them more efficient. And obviously, you get the knock-on benefits from that as well. Have you seen others in the industry also pulling back on capacity? And I think you particularly the year of particularly dissolving pulp? Yes, we have. If I look at uh, 
both in Europe and in the US, we've seen capacity coming out in our traditional paper businesses. Mm-hmm. On the dissolving pulp, less so. There was one or two weaker operators that came out during the period where market conditions were not so good. But at the moment, we are seeing a, a kind of pickup in supply now coming into that marketplace. Is SAPI now sort of right-sized and sort of rationalized strategically for the industry and the market that's out there? Or is there still some more to do? I think we've come a long way. If you went back to, say, 10 years ago, SAPI was about 80% graphic paper, which is the high-end marketing paper that SAPI was known for. And we've been on a journey to transform. As things currently stand, we're about 45% now in this Mm -hmm. graphic paper space, the rest being made up with obviously dissolving pulp and packaging. My goal is to get it to 30% by 27. So there's a few further initiatives underway that will get us to those levels. And obviously the excitement is that we'll be very much in growing market segments, higher margin segments, yeah. and, and the business will be in a much better place. And part of that's your Somerset, the PM2 project, which apparently April's your completion date. Yeah, we were very excited about that. It's actually the biggest project that SAPI has ever undertaken from a cost perspective. It's, mm. it's costing us $420 million. It's a lot of money. Things are on track and we're scheduled to complete that in April, as you indicate, and very excited about that ramp up. It's going to give us, not only is it a conversion, but it's going to give us 250,000 tons of additional capacity in the packaging space. And from my understanding, from I'll be honest, I went down a bit of a, a rabbit hole around it because, of course, you've got a plant there already. This is really advanced tech. Yeah, it's this was a mill that was in that traditional graphic paper space, and it's a huge mill, and mm-hmm. uh, it's made up of three big machines. We converted the first machine about four years ago now, and that's been very successful for us. Now we're converting a second machine. The U.S. domestic market has been very good for us, and our customers were indicating that they wanted more volume in the packaging space, and that's why we made the second conversion. You mentioned in the results, supply chain instability, fluctuating input costs. The fluctuating input costs I absolutely get, and it's always that case of certainty. You prefer it low rather than high, but you'd prefer it stable. But I was surprised that you're still seeing supply chain challenges. Yeah, look, there's been a number of incidents. Obviously, the war in the Middle East and its impact on shipping going through that region, and many vessels have had to be redirected, not necessarily sappy vessels, Mm -hmm. but because of the knock-on effect on the rest of the global shipping industry, that's had an impact on us. And then, obviously, you know, in South Africa, you always have challenges at our ports getting product out the country. So, you know, that's an ongoing thing. You know, I think we've been able to deal with that. And it does feel like globally that shipping prices are starting to come down a bit and things are normalizing. Last question. You mentioned South Africa there and you actually talk around driving record profitability in the region. Yeah, we had a great year. In fact, it was our third consecutive year of record profits in South Africa. We we are a major exporter out of South Africa. Most of our product is consumed domestic. It goes offshore and, you know, we, we've got a globally competitive business that uh, is cost efficient and, you know, it's going from strength to strength, predominantly around dissolving pulp. And, you know, South Africa is good to us and, you know, we continue to invest in the country. What markets is it exporting into? It predominantly goes to India, goes to China, and some into Europe as well, and a little bit to Indonesia. So we export from South Africa over a million tons of wow. dissolving pulp. Wow. Okay, that is a giant number. We'll leave it there. Steve Binney, SAPI CEO, appreciate the time. Let your money weather the storms with Stanlib Asset Management. Invest in the Stanlib Global Select Fund, a diversified all-weather equity portfolio sub-managed by J.P. Morgan Asset Management. MoneyWeb now on the money. Some Friday thoughts on on finding snippets of data and, and kind of piece, piece, piecing them together. The, the the financial markets just is a haystack of of uh, uh, commentary, opinion, data, results, price movements. There, there's probably no other industry or sector which has as many uh, data points in any single moment, hour, week, day, uh, etc. And 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 there's usefulness in in piecing things together. Uh, three examples we'll have. Uh, 
Roberts. We uh, saw the, the trading update from them earlier in the week. Um, and as I said in the intro, the, the, the lenders are now kind of in control of Marion Roberts. No fun there at all. But they had a small little snippet towards the end of the statement where they talk around, they're doing contract mining for De Beers at one of the diamond mines out in Limpopo, and that is being de-scoped. They vague as to whether it's being completely cut or reduced or something, but that just gives us a little bit of extra insight into De Beers uh, and diamond sales. Now, we kind of know that, right? Because we see it from the Anglo-American updates. We see it from when the the diamond uh, site sales, which Anglo-American publishes on Sense. uh, And that uh, mine out in Limpopo is only about 600,000 carats a year. So it's not massive in the world of De Beers, but it does tell us that just how tough it really, really is. The other one was uh, Truers. I was chatting with uh, Carmen there. And what we saw earlier in the week, as I suggested, was uh, Pep, who came out with a fairly good update and said, we're gaining market share. And whenever someone's gaining market share, the question is always, well, from who? Uh, that, that That's the big uh, uh, question. Well, it's from Truers. I mean, we, the Truers didn't directly tell us, but 0.2% increase in local sales. If you assu- assume there's some extra square meterage from new stores and you assume some price selling inflation, I would wager that they could be down in terms of volumes by 5 maybe even 10%. Where's it going? Well, it's going to Pepco, and we can see it in those numbers there. Uh, the other, of course, is Grinrod and Maputo. Grinrod did put a statement out uh, yesterday, uh, but we knew earlier in the week already that things were sort of moving the one d- wrong direction. Over the weekend, we had seen reports of violence. Uh, I think it was Tuesday when the uh, Mozambican government shut down the internet in in, in the country, uh, and that then immediately tells you it, it's that spider web of data and trying to pull it all together and get the pieces all lining up. No one of them necessarily market moving or necessarily uh, f- making you jump and make a decision, but it's uh, threading that needle and getting the individual pieces all together. That's it for today. I was chatting with uh, Nikki Giles from Prescient Fund Services yesterday. We were talking talking around actively managed ETFs, AM ETFs. We've certainly seen a, a rise of them locally. Uh, as she pointed out, they've become really big in Europe uh, and, and the US. Uh, and question we asked you, are you using these in your investment portfolio? They're pretty much unit trusts listed on the JSC, uh, although in many cases cheap and better liquidity, cheaper in terms of fees. Uh, it was evenly split between a third of you saying you don't know enough about them, a third of you saying, nope, I have no need for them, and then a third of you saying, yeah, actually, these are great products and you definitely are using them. This podcast is brought to you by Standlip Asset Management. Invest in more certainty to navigate volatile market conditions. We're live every weekday morning on the MoneyWeb website and the app, 6.30 a.m. podcast just after 7. Thanks to my team, Eddie Nobokle, Nicole, to you for listening, my guests for their time. My name is Simon Brown. This is MoneyWeb Now. If you're loving the show, please leave us a positive rating and a review in your podcatcher of choice. We'll chat again Monday. Bonds beating equity in local markets. You've been listening to another MoneyWeb Now podcast, posted every weekday at 7 a.m. on moneyweb.co.za. MoneyWeb Now, on the money.